and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where we find ourselves, thanks to the dual strikes of last year, in an entertainment wasteland. It's bleak! But luckily, Hollywood has managed to contain it to just two months. All we have to do is get to March, and then there will at least be a trickle. A trickle of IP. So in the meantime, this is what we've got left for movies. We've got Argyle, Lisa Frankenstein, Bob Marley One Love, Madam Webb, and Ordinary Angels. Maybe there's a box office breakout somewhere in that mix. Uh, you know, maybe the lack of other content will allow one of those movies to shine. We'll see. I guess, you know, maybe Madam Webb is good, but I think my bets would be uh, Argyle, maybe. Uh, and then I think Ordinary Angels might do surprisingly well. Then with shows, there's Griselda, Masters of the Air, Feud Season 2, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I'd love for that to be a breakout hit, but I'm not sure. And then, thankfully, whoo, Netflix's live-action Avatar The Last Airbender. All it has to do is be serviceable, and so far, so good. And it will benefit from being one of just two major water cooler projects to release during this two-month period. The other one, of course, being Mean Girls. All right, now, Mean Girls, despite absolutely no competition this weekend, sorry, ISS, it still dropped 60% in only its second weekend, likely due to those low audience scores. Wonka might be doing well, but it would seem that, yes, for the most part, audiences still don't like musicals, which is too bad, because these are good musicals. But hey, just like audiences don't really like Westerns right now, I haven't for a while. It's just the way it is. The first Mean, Ge mean Girls fell just 44% in, it, in its second weekend. Going up, let's have a little flashback here. It's slow, why not? With a new release of Van Helsing uh, topping it in its second weekend, and it was also going up against, later in their releases, Man on Fire, 13 going on 30. These were only released two weeks apart. Isn't that crazy? I mean, what kind of a weird release schedule is that? Uh, and then also Kill Bill Volume 2. So, but Mean Girls was able to hold its own, and the OG Plastics walked off with 86 million domestic in 2004, which today would be 145 million. 0.9 million. Usually we don't talk about the adjusted box office. I know to some of your annoyance, because you guys are like, what about adjusted? Well, no movie would ever do well if we compared it to adjusted box office, which is Hollywood's dirty secret. Because like back in the day with um, uh, Gone with the Wind, where you could pay to see that with a can of goods because of the depression, those movies were making way more than any movie ever makes today. They were also back then the only game in town for entertainment, pretty much. All right, so, but yeah, we're going to do inflation today. So the new Mean Girls, uh, even though it has no competition again this coming weekend, that's three weekends all to itself pretty much, it's unlikely to get to 86 million, much less 145.9. But that's okay. As we discussed last week, it was made for very little money and should do well on digital before it eventually heads to Paramount Plus, which is where it was always where it was originally intended to debut. And I think this is enough money that it's making and it's getting a lot of attention, which I think will help it down the line on digital and then streaming, that it was the right call to make it a theatrical release, theatrical release instead of a Paramount Plus exclusive. Now that you've seen how it's done, what do you feel? Do you feel Paramount made the right call? I think it did. Slam dunk. And, but as I said last week, there are still career boosts to be had here. However, now I feel maybe not for as many people. So I still think the Tina Fey directing duo Perez and Jane and Renee Rapp will get a boost from this. Everyone else, it'll be very nice to have it on their resume, but they're going to have to work a little bit harder to capitalize on Mean Girls 2.0. I don't think anyone's going to come get them, but maybe they can use it to get something themselves, basically is what I'm saying. Rap was on SNL last night, great timing, and she was the one who trended top 10 during the telecast and not host Jacob Elordi. I noticed, and I'm sure Hollywood noticed as well. And if they didn't, I'm sure her representation will point it out. That's, that's what you pay him the 10% for. It's also worth noting that Rap got major assists last night, and it's good to have friends. Hollywood is a business of relationships, and she got Megan the Stallion, to, to do one of her, the musical numbers, because of course they have a song that they've teamed on together. Uh, and boy, that was a great reveal for uh, Megan Thee Stallion. She is quite the showwoman, I must say. I'm very impressed with her. 
And then, of course, the OG Regina George, Rachel McAdams. Yes, McAdams finally showed up. She has been reluctant to be associated with anything Mean Girls for a while now, from this new movie to the recent Walmart commercial. She wouldn't even be in that one, even though everybody else was. Uh, but with Mean Girls dominating the news cycle for the past few weeks and now a success story, hey, number one is number one, and no future, pro I think this is the big one, no future projects lined up for McAdams at the moment, at least publicly, and I don't know why you'd keep them a secret. So I think she made the right call to jump on the uh, pink train as it goes, toot toot, all aboard. Well, again, not everybody can be on board. It's a smaller train than we anticipated, but I think there's a seat on it for McAdams. But I think it was a missed opportunity not to do a Regina George sketch. They could have been dueling Regina Georges, or they could have just something, maybe they, could, maybe they would want to keep it positive. I don't know. But I think to see both of them side by side and Rachel McAdams back in the Regina George getup, that would have been fantastic. Instead, McAdams ended up being featured in another sketch with just a Lordy. I think that that would have gotten a much bigger deal. Like right now, I think fans of rap and Mean Girls are talking about this and McAdams fans, but I think everybody would be talking about it. You'd be seeing the clip, the, the sketch everywhere, and it would be an iconic instant, instant classic sketch. Uh, but I think maybe it was just enough to talk McAdams into coming on it and doing a little bit. I don't know if you could have convinced her to go all the way, but I mean, if you're going to do it, do it is my opinion. Uh, but I guess no one can just give those hard facts to McAdams because she might bolt from the studio, and I can see that too. All right, as for, I mean, anyone who Rachel McAdams trusts should have given her that advice. All right, as for the rest of the top 10, The Beekeeper fell just 49% in its second weekend, but it's still pretty far behind, even Mean Girls, at just 31 million total. That will be on digital very, very soon, and some of you said it was an awesome movie, so it could do quite well on digital. On that note, while there are no big movies opening next weekend in theaters, it's raining recent releases on digital. Oh boy, look at this. You've got Aquaman 2, Migration, Wish, all of those are confirmed. And supposedly, whispers say that Night Swim and Ferrari will also be released, all on Tuesday. Wowza! So with that, and the NFL championship games on next, next Sunday, well, Sunday today and next Sunday to determine the Super Bowl? You got plenty to watch at home. Uh, but again, theaters, you know, I guess that theaters don't want to go up against uh, the championship games, but I mean, I don't know. I guess this is their way of going up against it, which I guess is okay. I mean, because again, this is the studios get this money as well, but um, this poor theater owners are left out in the cold. Uh, Wonka, by the way, hits digital next Tuesday, which is great scheduling because it's already made over half a billion in theaters. Look at the hold even this weekend. And this is far enough away still from Dune Part 2, so audiences don't get over Chalamet, but they still have a warm glow about Chalamet. They're like, hey, it's Wonka. I loved his movie. Let's go see what he's up to with all this sand. Uh, did you see Dune 1? I think a lot of people have at this point, right? I'm very curious to see how Dune 2 does. Uh, I'm excited about it. I think some of the later trailers have been quite good, and I thought the first one was visually stunning, although I know some people who are not at all excited about it because they didn't care for the first film. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm still not sure which way it's going to break. Some of you are like, it's going to be the next Oppenheimer craze. Get on now. So, that, you, know, so, you, so you like this one. I like the first Dune, uh, but I don't know if it's going to be another Oppenheimer. But let's see. Let's see. I'm open to it. Uh, but Migration, by the way, is still doing quite well in theater. So maybe is it too early to put it on digital? But, you know, they did that with Trolls Band together, and that still continues to do well in theaters anyway. And Migration should still clear the century mark the next week uh, because it's just so close already, even though it's going on digital. Meaning that both of Universal's animation houses will have been able to clear the century mark with their 2023 entries, while Disney... Only one of their houses was able to do that. And it wasn't the one that started at all. They got to whip that division into shape. Uh, as a matter of fact, Wish is the lowest grossing animated movie of 2023 from a major studio. I mean, come on, man. Anyone but you had yet another amazing hold week to week to week. I mean, still, it's not like uh, it's not going to pass the century mark, but this is incredible for this film, the staying power that, is ha that it has had. And I'm very curious to see what happens when it eventually hits digital and then streaming. I think, you know, Sydney Sweeney is probably really hoping that this built her up enough that she can withstand the storm that is coming by co-starring in Morbius Meets the Marvels. I think I might have pegged it. 
Wow, we'll see. I mean, they haven't. Are they even going to bother to release a second trailer for Madam Web? It is coming up fast. Uh, maybe a Super Bowl spot. You think Sony would spend that money? I and mean, that's just a few days before the movie releases. Uh, and Ariana DeBose continues to have a rough 2024 with her new movie barely registering at the box office. But thankfully, she wasn't used to promote the film. I mean, at first that must have been disappointing, but now she can be like, well, nobody knew she was in it, so none of her fans went to see it. But I mean, does, I wonder how many fans Ariana DeBose has, because she's also, of course, in Wish. She's the, I thought she did a great job with the voice in Wish. That's a shame that didn't, it wasn't her fault, it was the story. She was, I thought her voice work and singing, obviously, were excellent in Wish. And I thought she was good in West Side Story, but she's just, for some reason, she's not clicking in Hollywood. I think she's going to have to go find her own damn project is what she's going to have to do. All right, and just last weekend, we were wondering, when are they going to expand Poor Things? And the answer was this weekend with, the ad, with adding uh, 820 screens. So now it has like a wide release, basically. It's, it's, it's basically you would consider this wide. It's not super wide, but it qualifies as wide. But yet the per theater average is still quite low. I mean, when you expand like this, that means you're in a lot of marketplaces that you weren't before. So you would think there would be like a pent up uh, demand to finally see this thing. Uh, but no, there's not. I think proving that Yorgos Lanthimos's appeal is very limited. But luckily, a lot of people who vote for awards shows are in the group that think he's awesome. I mean, even Emma Stone can't get these numbers up. And she's, she's, uh, she, she has quite a number of fans. Why have you decided not to see poor things in theaters if you haven't already, right? Are you waiting for digital or streaming? Or do you think you'll just maybe skip it entirely? Again, some people love it, some people hate it. You know, you could be in the love it category, I'm in the hate it category, but you know, some people really, really like this movie. But I just, again, I want to note, this isn't to discourage you from seeing the film, I want to make that clear, but I just want you to know what you're getting into and who you see it with, it is a very graphic film. All right, and oh yeah, how did Aquaman 2 do at the box office? Let's take a look. So it's just around 400 million. That's about where it's going to end its run. It's heading again to digital on Tuesday. It has more than 100 million less than Wonka, which I think kind of shows you the state that superhero movies are in right now. Although to some degree, DC shot itself in the foot by announcing that all these movies, the last few films were worthless. They weren't going to go anywhere. Uh, however, it's still bigger than any DCEU movie since the first Aquaman, you know, since the Snyderverse was in its prime. This is, did better than all the recent releases, so I think Jason Momoa can hold his head high, and James Wan will likely get another non-horror blockbuster. I mean, he should. His track record is fantastic. Uh, two out of his three non-horror films are billion-dollar pictures. I mean, he definitely knows what he's doing. Uh, I'll be curious to see what he gets. Uh, I mean, he's very busy in the horror space as a producer and a director, but I don't think he should give up on non-horror. He obviously has real skill there. Uh, speaking of Zack Snyder, though, the Snyderverse, while Rebel Moon couldn't break a billion minutes, its uh, debut weekend over on Nielsen, at least it made the overall chart at number five. Now, I mean, not what we were hoping, but I mean, it's okay. Uh, young, we'll talk about Rebel Moon a little bit more uh, when, we get, when we get to movies. Uh, young Sheldon and Reacher, still both on top, with Young Sheldon showing that audiences are still hungry for good and newish sitcoms. So maybe somebody should try and bring back the sitcom. Network TV, you're not dead yet. Uh, and Reacher, I think, is the new Yellowstone, and that it's a show with a conservative angle, but that it still has broad appeal. So it's, it goes beyond that. And so I think that's a, that's a big win for everybody involved. It's also nice to see the crown going out strong. Uh, on the originals chart, while Percy Jackson couldn't make the overall chart, here it is at number four with its two episode debut. That's pretty solid and interestingly enough on par with recent Disney, other recent Disney Plus shows, Ahsoka and Loki. If not, I think maybe a scooch stronger. I think with weekly drops, even two episodes at once instead of a binge, this might be the highest a show can get which is, you know, something I think we have to factor in when we're looking at ratings. But it sure would be nice, as we said, as I just said, number one is number one. And it sure would be nice to see these shows get a little higher and on the overall chart. So maybe they can do something. I think the weekly release is better for interest and coverage and discussion. But, you know, I think what Netflix does is they do like two, what Netflix has decided to do is a happy medium where they do seasons in two parts. So it extends the conversation a little bit, but still they have a big chunk of episodes all at once that really help their numbers. And so um, 
Disney Plus shows are probably actually doing pretty good. But in pers- when you have the perspective, you put them up on the streaming charts, they look weak, which it, this is, I mean, that's, perception is a real thing. And this is something that Disney Plus has to figure out how to get around. And hey, Peacock is on here with the new season of Dr. Death. Although I didn't even watch the season of Dr. Death because this, this storyline doesn't appeal to me. But the first season of Dr. Death was amazing. And so I'm annoyed that nobody watched that. Now people are watching the new one. I'm like, go back and watch the first season. It was incredible. I'm thinking maybe Mandy Moore's This Is Us audience followed her here. Maybe Mandy Moore. Maybe she's, maybe she's developed. Speaking of fans, maybe Mandy Moore finally has some. Then on the movies chart, it would have been real nice if Rebel Moon could have debuted at number one. But alas, it didn't. And it was taken out by Friendly Fire from Netflix's other big movie from uh, that time, Leave the World Behind, which has plenty of star power. But while Rebel Moon, in contrast, is engineered that Zack Snyder is really the star. And he's certainly a draw. But there ain't nothing wrong or no shame with having a safety net in name talent in the movie as well. I'd say Snyder should try to reteam with Henry Cavill, but other directors who are struggling for respect in Hollywood have already gotten their hands on him. That's right, Chad Stahelski and Guy Ritchie. They went, yoink, let's see if we can ride this guy's coattails. Uh, They're all like on the fringe of Hollywood and let's see if they can battle their way back in. It's crazy, you know, that Chad Stahelski is on the fringe. I don't know what he's doing that he can't get more respect. All right, and right before Christmas, it's very nice to see National Lampoon and Jim Carrey's The Grinch get a nod from audiences as well, uh, as, well as they join the Christmas trinity of uh, Home Alone, Elf, and 2018's Animated Grinch. As for Netflix's charts, Kevin Hart came in hot with his latest original movie, this time a heist film, which you know, did extremely well. Kevin Hart is another great deal for Netflix. Also, it's worth noting that Society of the Snow has been the number one non-English language movie for Netflix for two weeks in a row, posting huge global numbers, especially compared to other non-English language content. Is a Netflix deal in director J.A. Bayona's future? I think so. I think he's a great director. I feel bad that he did, he's not getting enough respect from Hollywood after Fallen Kingdom, which I thought was a good movie. But yeah, let's, I, think, I see a path forward for him here. You know, maybe Netflix, maybe some other streaming service, but this is excellent. Uh, and also, very good cast, very strong cast. I did see the film. I'll tell you my thoughts on it in a moment. But if I were a casting director or a producer or even a director who had a producer hat on sometimes, I would start looking through this cast as well. These two guys are my top two picks. Who would be your top draft picks out of this movie? I liked the film. It's extremely bleak. It was very, I would watch it maybe as a matinee in the afternoon or the morning. It was a tough watch for the nighttime and then go to sleep. Uh, But of course, it's based on a true story, which was incredibly bleak. But I thought that Bayona's The Impossible, although that that movie was unfortunately whitewashed, I thought that was a touch better from a storytelling perspective. But I did like this film. I did like it. With series, people, I have to say, when I turned it on originally, because I was, you know, in the United States, Netflix turned it on uh, automatically with the English dub, which I thought was interesting. And uh, it was a very good quality dub. Uh, I was I was having a, a spaghetti dinner while I watched it, uh, whole wheat spaghetti. So I, it was too hard to read subtitles while eating. So I actually ended up, I'm sorry to say, watching the dub. Uh, and I thought it was a very, very good dub. Uh, but I'm curious, how did you watch The Society of the Snow? Original language? I mean, before I've been like, how dare you not watch it in an original language with subtitles? But I have to say, Netflix's dub was such high quality that I can see how many people are going with the dub. But I'm curious what you decided to do. Uh, with series, people are still loving Harlan Coben's latest. While the brother's son was able to rise to number two for its first full week on this list, you know, a lot of shows debut at the end of the week, series and movies, uh, but it's a very weak number two. I don't see a second season for that show at all. And Dave Chappelle's stand-up special is still in the top 10 for the third week and edging out Pete Davidson's brand new special, which shows how short-lived the window is for these stand-up shows. Uh, You you know, we see series and movies on these charts for weeks on end, sometimes months. Uh, But I think stand-up, for the most part, a solid stand-up show can do two weeks on the list. list. So three for Chappelle, uh, I think, is very strong. Although, as some of you might point out, uh, his first chart, he was only on it for one day. I think it dropped at the very... Stand-up specials also have weird drop times. Sometimes they drop at the beginning of the week or at the very, very end of it. 
Finally over on iTunes, while the Marvels was briefly number one during the week, Napoleon is back on top by today. By the way, I saw a number of people very confused and frustrated that it was not simultaneously released on Disney+, Plus, which Disney used to do. Uh, they used to do digital and Disney Plus simultaneously. But no, there's not enough money in that. So they're doing whatever, you know, it, Warner Brothers Discovery also changed. They're all following the universal model, which prints money which is theatrical release, digital release, and then later on a streaming release at no extra cost. But they want to make the digital money first. Uh, although I think people are so used to waiting for Disney Plus that they wait for Disney Plus for these movies more than at the other studios. What do you do? Which ones, which movies do you buy when they get on digital and which ones are you okay waiting for the streaming service? Uh, so although all of this week's new releases are in the top 10 still, so that's encouraging, uh, we're talking the Marvels, the Boys in the Boat, and the Color Purple, but not Taika Waititi's next goal wins. That's stuck at number 14, and I think he just really damaged his career with Thor Love and Thunder. I think before that, that there will be more interest in that film, even though apparently it's not that great. But I think, you know... You know, it's a digital release, and it's a major movie from Taika Waititi. It takes place in a beautiful tropical setting. It's based on an inspiring true story, and it stars Michael Fassbender. That nobody wants to click on it is a problem. Did you click on it? Was it good? Should the rest of us watch it? And speaking of non-English language content, Anatomy of a Fall, where a large part of the film is in French, although some of it's in English, it continues to do very well on digital. It's a great film. As I said I, on a, a live stream, and I tweeted, I finally watched it, and I highly recommend it. I think it's excellent. Uh, as for this coming week's new releases, as I've been saying, pretty bleak. In theaters, Godzilla Minus One releases a black and white version, Godzilla Minus color is I think what they're calling it and that's a beautiful poster and that's a funny thing to say although when you first look at it I think it means like it is in color and I'm like so that I think that's a little confusing but I'll be curious to see how it does especially with no competition and then also on Wednesday Dune is back for one night only in IMAX and sales have been incredibly strong it's one showing on one night but still I think this proves that the core fan base is pumped and that's crucial for any IP because you need them to drive the traffic that might get other casuals you know casuals to check it out. They're like, oh, there seems to be a party over there. Let's go look at it. Uh, but you know, if there's no party to begin with, then no one's going to pay attention. And it's definitely a party for these Dune screenings. Uh, there are a few little tickets in the front left here and there if, you, if you'd like to go. Uh, as I said, there's a ton of movies coming out on digital. And out of these, I highly recommend Migration. Illumination Entertainment, always a solid bet. This one's very good. Well, Aquaman 2. Well, I think the ending, the third act, is not great. I think for the most part, it's a fun time if you're into it. Uh, and if you're, a fan of, if you're a fan of Jason Momoa, Patrick Wilson, and Randall Park, I think then you'll, in particular, and yeah, yeah, Abdul Mateen II, but his role is a little bit smaller. But, you know, those are four great dudes. I mean, you'll have a pretty good time. Uh, as I, I gave it a Rotten Tomato, though. I still stand by it because it just, for, based on the first Aquaman, this was just too far a drop. And there was just some cringe moments in it that I just couldn't, couldn't get past. Uh, as, for streaming, as for streaming movies, Prime Video has Underdogs with Snoop Dogg, and Netflix has a Korean post-apocalyptic film. Uh, there's also, in America, football this Sunday and next, as it's the road to the Super Bowl, which is on Sunday, February 11th. Uh, that will also be no movies coming out that weekend, although that's typical because, you know, that'll be Argyle's second weekend, so that's pretty good. All right, series, there's a little movement here. On Thursday, Netflix drops both Griselda and Part 2 of Masters of the Universe, while on Friday, Prime Video, these are two actually very interesting series that I don't think either streaming service is doing a good job getting the word out on. So I'll do it. All right, so Prime Video has expats that not only stars Nicole Kidman as a woman in Hong Kong, but Nicole Kidman is also the producer because she liked the material so much, and she hired the director of The Farewell. Remember that Aquafina movie? I think that, that sounds really solid. And then this is the big one. Apple TV has Masters of the Air. Now, I've seen the trailer here and there out of the corner of my eye, and I've been like, I've seen a lot of World War II stuff lately. You know, like I feel a little World War II'd out. But look at this talent. So this is the latest World War II series from Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. And I know some of you love those, which is why they keep making them. 
It stars Austin Butler, a.k.a. Elvis. And I was like, eh, I don't know. I think it's, I'm, I'm like, is he going to sound like Elvis? Uh, but Callum Turner from The Boys in the Boat, he's fantastic there. Barry Keegan, who's coming off of Saltburn, he's going to be in this movie. And Anthony freaking Boyle, I love this guy. He was from the Harry Potter uh, Broadway Cursed Child uh, play, which I saw him in, and he's phenomenal. So I'm very happy for him. And then, behind the camera, stars as well. Carrie freaking Fukunaga, uh, Anna Boden and Ryan Fleck. Hey, their, Mar their Captain Marvel movie made a billion dollars, even though it was not particularly well directed. But their Mrs. America series was phenomenal. And then Dee Reese from Mudbound, the director of Mudbound. What a lineup of talent. I don't think Apple TV is doing a good enough job letting people know that this is what they have. All right, so that, so I hope maybe, I, I'm, I think I'm going to check that one out for sure. I might check out both of them, but do, you know, do any of those now sound a little bit more promising to you? So that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And how do you plan to get through this barren wasteland until March? What projects, what few scant projects are you excited about? Share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.